Hi there. We're about to start our final plenary of the day. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Kate Flint, and I teach at the University of Southern California, just down the road. And although he isn't here at the moment, so far as I can see, I really want to extend my deepest gratitude to my friend and colleague, Devin Griffiths, who honestly has run this brilliantly under the most unanticipated circumstances. And I also want to thank the team of uh, graduate student and other colleagues who have helped make this as much of a success as, well, more of a success than could be possible under these circumstances. So thank you, Devin, and thank you all. So perhaps the greatest pleasure that one can have when introducing a keynote speaker is to be able to say that they're one's former student. And I'm proud and not a little humbled to be introducing Pablo Mukherjee, Professor of English at Warwick University. Pablo came to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship to do his MPhil degree. And his work then, and for his Cambridge PhD, formed the basis of his first book, Crime and Empire, representing India in the 19th century. After that, he moved into environmental criticism, which is probably what most of you here will know him for. He published Postcolonial Environments, Nature, Culture, and Contemporary Indian Novel in English in 2010, and Natural Disasters and Victorian Imperial Culture, Fevers, and Famines in 2013. Not that this is all, with his colleagues in the Warwick Research Collective, he co-edited Combined and Uneven Development towards a new theory of world literature, which came out in 2015, and he guest edited a special issue of the Yearbook of English Studies, which I'm sure you all know, on Victorian world literatures. In Postcolonial Environments, the first of his works of environmental scholarship, Pablo critiques how forms of empire, both past and present, create a state of permanent war on the global environment. In emphasizing the eco-materialist aesthetics that tie humans and nature together, or that indeed render it impossible to think about them as separate categories, Pablo uses the fiction of South Asia to bring home the uneven spatial and cultural conditions of post-colonial modernity, together with the formal innovations within novels that bring home these multiply fractured environments. The book made a really important intervention. It was an essential correction to the universalizing assumptions about the centrality and universality of Western liberalism that one finds all too frequently in contemporary eco-criticism. And then in Natural Disasters and Victorian Imperial Culture, another major contribution to our thinking about ecology in global terms, Pablo influentially argues that, and I'm quoting him, our ideas about disasters that underlie such diverse fields and practices as governance, medicine, environmental law, developmental economics, and crucially, literature and culture, grew out in important ways of the British imperial experience in 19th century South Asia. And he works this through really compellingly in relation to the Edens and Fanny Parks, Philip Meadows Taylor, and Rudyard Kipling's writings about cholera. I mean, there is, of course, something rather too aptly prescient about this subject matter not least because we're told that practicing online teaching next week, well, if COVID-19 doesn't get us, the readiness will stand us in really good stead for the big earthquake. Just out, Final Frontiers, Science Fiction and Techno Science in Nunderland, India, the first book-length study of non-Anglophone science fiction, putting literature, policy, and geopolitics into a necessary historical perspective is another major contribution. In this, Pablo looks at the combined and uneven historical axes 
of Cold War non-alignment, Nehruvian techno-scientific policy, and Indian modernization in the 20th century world system. Not just, though, in order to understand that kind of long life of Indian science fiction, but to use it as an opportunity to imagine in a counterfactual way how we might have arrived at an alternative present. This book brings together, I might add, some of the characteristics that I've always, and I mean always, hugely admired about Pablo. His intellectual hunger and curiosity, his engagement with the processes of history, and probably even above all of that, his passionate commitment to politics and to social and environmental justice. He'll be speaking today about fossil imprints, energy justice, colonial writing, post-colonial theory. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to take a minute or two to actually really thank um, a few people. Uh, Devin, of course, I don't know if he's here. Um, he's here. He's been an amazing, amazing host, uh, keeping me updated about COVID-19 every two minutes. So <laughs> thank you, Devin. Um, Sarah, I don't know if Sarah's here, with her super funky Fiat, drove me around and showed me downtown LA, uh, which was a real pleasure. Um, Kate, um, so Kate may not remember this. Um, so the first, I, I, um, I came to Oxford totally accidentally in a fraudulent manner, right? I wasn't, I was, you know, for some reason, Rose gave me your money and I didn't apply for it. And there's a big story, which I won't go into. Um, but um, so I turned up for Kate's first of my, um, my seminars with Kate. And I came from, you know, having been a student in Calcutta and then worked as a journalist really for three years. I've, I knew I was going to be here for a couple of years, maybe. I had no, um, not just ambitions, but no ideas that I'd stay in academia. And so I turned up for the first seminar, and Kate gave me a, you know, bibliography of around 55 pages uh, for that week's reading. So I was looking at it. I was going, because in Calcutta, you're, like, you're given something, you have to do the whole thing, right? So I was looking at it, I was going, seriously, this is one of like four, four courses? I'm going to read this for... This is really not for me. So next week I turned up and I apologized. I said, listen, I've, I've done maybe three of those 54, you know, whatever, um, readings. And she said, you try to read all, all of that? What, what are you like? It's just, that's for the rest of, you know, that's, that's a bibliography. You read it at your leisure. And she kind of like, okay, maybe I can still do it, do this thing. <laughs> so she was, yeah, I mean, I'm really... Um, it's been, a, it's been a privilege to be taught by her, and it's uh, in, in a weird way history goes. There she is introducing me, so thank you, Kate. Uh, of course, for the rest of you, my, you might, she, she, she also insisted I did a PhD and so on, so the rest of you after today might feel that that was a wrong move, but that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my fault. Um, so, and also, of course, I get, got to, like many of you, I'm a big Kim Stanley Robinson fan, so got to meet him and you know, hang out with him yesterday and this morning, and he's in a large measure responsible for this latest book that Kate was talking about, Final Frontier, which is on science fiction and, um, and 20th century, mid 20th century South Asian um, writing. So I got to thank with him personally. I get to call him Stan. It's like, how cool is that? That's, that's great. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about something that's entirely new for me, um, which is energy justice. Uh, post-colonial theory and colonial writing. I'm just trying to see how I can flick through the, oh, um, let's see if that works. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, the first section, I'm just going to uh, try and uh, read two excerpts from two texts side by side to introduce to you the notion of uh, energy justice, but with, in a 19th century idiom. So let me begin by invoking two seemingly different calls for justice from two literary classics of the high colonial era. In the closing moments of the first act of Dinamondu Mitro's play, Neil Dorpon, um, or the Indigo Mirror, um, are any of you familiar with this play? Okay, you are. So um, I will try and do a little bit of summary as I go. So Shavitri, the wife of a Bengali gentleman farmer, Golok Basu, is forced to revise her opinions about, the, about their English overlords, and that's the quotation you have it there. The indigo planters can do anything. Then why do I hear generally said that the, that the sahibs are strict in dispensing justice? 
Again, my son Bindu Madhav uh, speaks much in praise of them. Therefore, I think that these are not sahibs. No, they're the dregs or chandals of sahibs. I'll come back to that term chandals in a second. Uh, there are some striking things about Sabitri's lament here, not least of which um, is how Mitra codes the colonial failure to dispense justice as an affirmation of conservative Hindu caste hierarchy. The offending Englishmen can only be imagined as lower or more precisely outcast Indians or chandals. Also notable is how justice is presented as the colonial hegemonic device par excellence. As Shabitri said, it is generally thought of as an attribute of the English and particularly so by those belonging to the aspirational indigenous class fraction that the Basus, her family, belong to. But less visible is the relationship between the kind of work that these dregs of Englishmen are engaged in, the aggressive building of a gigantic agribusiness empire centered on the indigo plant and the injustices that Mitra's incendiary play was written against. Think then of another moment towards the end of Rudyard Kipling's 1898 short story, The Bridge Builders. Again, some of you will be familiar uh, with the story. Um, as he waits to find out whether his bridge can survive the onslaught of a suddenly flooded river, the English engineer Finlayson, in his opium perfume, I'll come back to this indigo-opium relationship in a bit, in his opium perfume dream, stumbles into the court proceedings of Hindu gods and goddesses. The river Ganges appears as a petitioner there. They have, that's the quotation, they have made it too strong for me. In all this night, I have only torn away a handful of planks, the wall stand, the tower stand. They have chained my flood and my river is not free anymore. It is I, Mother Ganga, that speaks the justice of gods. Deal me the justice of gods. Like Mitra's plays, there are, very, there are many striking aspects of this passage, amongst which are, is the seeming inversion of how justice, or the lack of it, appeared in the earlier, that is in Mitra's, uh, in Mitra's play, in the earlier text. In Kipling's tale, it is the construction of a railway bridge, that Victorian icon of modernity, that is apparently misconceived as an act of injustice by an antiquarian India embody, uh, embodied in its gods. However, in the celestial court's later dismissal of the river's petition, we are returned to the hegemonic status of justice under modern colonial regimes. Even the Hindu gods, particularly those who pat patronize the, quote, fat moneylenders and their, quote, account books, become champions of Britain's civilizing mission. The typically complex irony deployed by Kipling, the justice of colonialism here is literally the pipe dream of a sick English engineer, serves to undermine much of what is conventionally seen as a simple allegory of the white man's burden. But again, what tends to pass unnoticed is the issue that lies at the heart of the river or Ganges' pet petition, that it is the containment of her aquatic and energy by the railway bridge, which is of course itself a conduit of the fossilized energy of coal, which is at issue here. So in what follows, I'll off offer some preliminary speculations about the relationship between the kinds of justice and forms of energy that is in fact widely represented in colonial and post-colonial writing. So one of the things I'll, I'm going to try and argue here is our contemporary debates about energy justice, which in academic terms is about sort of less than a decade old, about seven or eight years old, much of this has already been rehearsed and refined introduced and thought about in 19th century writing. So I, I was interested in many of the panels, uh, people um, were rightly reflecting on why are we doing 19th century stuff, right? Why 19th century? So part of, part of uh, this, I mean, I've always, of course, for me, the 19th century has never ended, but part of what, um, uh, what I want to look at is how the literature should really modulate our theoretical debates uh, today. So the, the, so the next section is about post-colonial studies uh, and its uh, relationship with both energy humanities but energy justice in particular. So writing in the, uh, in the wake of the invasion and occupation of, I think that you have the quote there, uh, occupation of Iraq by the US-led allied forces, Neil, Laz Neil Lazarus and Priyambada Gopal pointed out uh, long ago now, 2006, the paradox this cataclysm posed to post-colonial studies as an academic discipline. And, and Lazarus and Gopal say, what we are proposing is that after Iraq, post-colonial studies must change not because the world has changed, but because Iraq shows that in quite substantial ways it has not changed. 
This sounds paradoxical, of course. Why should post-colonial studies have to change if and indeed because the world has not changed? The answer to this question is that up, up until now, post-colonial studies in its predominant aspect at least has demonstrated a notable disregard for the contemporary contemporaneity of in, imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism. So that, that's how they open that volume. Now, such perspectival lacuna, they suggested, was the result of the historical conditions of this academic field, marked simultaneously by the fading of the insurgent uh, energies of the anti-colonial national liberation movements of the Bandung era, and then the demise of, the, of Soviet socialism. Such epochal transforma transformations, in turn, gave rise, to the mis gave rise to the misconception, I'm summarizing their argument here, particularly among some professional Euro-American Euro academics, that all resistance to the now triumphant status quo of the Washington consensus, consensus was not only futile, but decisively over. Therefore, they argued, in order to remain, quote, constitutional, constitutionally a politically progressive intellectual field, post-colonial studies would now have to embrace a, quote, body of work that registers the actuality of the world system and the structuring effects of this system's, uh, this system's work. So such calls for making post-colonial studies more rigorously historical materialist are, of course, not new. Yet, Gopal and Lazarus' ease of Iraq as a conjuncture in the Gramscian sense in relation to post-colonial studies seems to me to be appropriate in so far it introduces a new paradigm to the field, in, new as in, in 2006, which may be summarized by a single word, energy. We have by now, 10 years after that volume, become accustomed to thinking about Iraq as an oil war. The evidence for this has been amply provided, both within the domain of mass media, famously by luminaries such as the American Republican Senator Chuck Hagel, the former chair of US Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, etc., as well as that of scholarly analysis. I'm thinking of the works of Javeri, Hearst, Colain, Mutet, etc. In this sense, therefore, as Gopal and Lazarus suggest, Iraq appear merely, appears merely as a single link in the long historical process of forcible appropriation of resources on a massive scale that we call imperialism or colonialism. But again, it may be that the specific nature of this resource, oil, compels us to reconsider not only how we think of empires and colonies, but also what we thought we knew about energy and its role in such historical formations and processes. For while oil is now acknowledged as that without which we, what we think of as modernity would not have come to pass, at least not in its current configuration, it is also the case that the central role it has played in the geoatmospheric event we, we are now calling climate change urges us to think not only of the social relationships conditioned by the use of this or that resource, but of the much deeper histories of energy, climate, and empires altogether. For example, to talk of Iraq, of course, is also to talk about justice and injustices. The myriad slogans and banners raised in the famous Million People March in London on February 15, 2003. Some of you may have been there. I was there. It's certainly the biggest political march I have been in my life. And I'm from India, so I'm used to volumes of people. That was truly amazing which remains the largest ever political demonstration in Britain against the invasion of the country quite explicitly linked the appropriation of oil to a corresponding lack or scarcity of justice in the context of a global new imperial dispensation. No blood for oil may have only been the most succinct of the many thousands of these pronouncements. But using this common sense to build theoretical, conceptual, or analytical tools has proved to be no easy task. What kind of justices do the various energy forms demand? Conversely, do all energies give rise to ideas of justices and practices of justice? Are access and affordability of energy adequate frameworks for thinking about justice? Such questions have entered academia and then again only some corners of it comparatively recently. If Heffron and Macaulay's 2017 study um, is correct, uh, energy justice first appeared as a term in research literature in 2010, and it was not before 2013 that it began to receive serious consideration. So this lag between the popular consciousness, so 2003, 2006, people were already on the streets talking about uh, um, um, no blood for oil, etc. Between this popular consciousness about the relationship between energy and justice and the conceptual the and theoretical considerations of them may in fact speak of a general difficulty of what we might call the energy imaginary. 
The scalar difference, and I've been really interested in how many uh, speakers have addressed this issue of scale in their writing in this conference, which has been really uh, helpful for me to think through these issues. Um, the scalar difference, as well as the symbiosis between particular forms of justice and the larger energy system as such, and the cultures and lived experiences of the long durée historical epochs, lie precisely at the heart of what Alan McDuffie calls the material and representational di dimensions of the current energy problem. For McDuffie, for McDuffie the, the failure to differentiate between energy as a usable resource and as an ambient energy agency circulating endlessly through the world can in, in the final instance be located in the 19th century, and in particular the pivotal figure of Robert Malthus, whose ideas of closed system of a, quote, single inescapable world environment may be then seen as the, one of the most durable interpretative fr frames deployed over the past two centuries. The Malthusian imagination, which, could properly, which should properly be thought of as environmental, is classically anthropocentric since it conceptualizing, conceptualizes energy primarily as a system running on fossil fuels and servicing a particular mode of production, industrial capitalism, which in turn supports human social relations marked by growth, consumption, and inequality. It proceeds analogically insofar that all other ways of life are subordinate subordinated to this logic, to see the world as a closed system, says uh, McDuffie in, in his book, as a domain, in his actually splendid study, as a domain in which usable energy is consistently decreasing, um, is in fact a sign of the way in which the urban industrial logic surreptitiously comes to structure the representation of everything, the city, the world, the cosmos, all these seemingly uh, analogously closed um, with entropy mounting and energy sinking towards zero because such subsists on finite supply of resources. So although the term uh, is uh, used here is urban industrial logic, uh, it is clear that what uh, McDuffie is talking about here is what Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, the imperative to subjugate, to imagine, uh, to Im in imagination and practice, all Lebenswelten uh, in the interests of, not of humans as such, but humans of a particular kind, homo economicus. If such a concept of world as a closed energy system is co-productive of modern capitalism, the field of energy humanities is conceived as a serious and conclusive challenge to it. One of the signals, so I, this section I'm not going to, I'm going to paraphrase as I go. Some of this has already come up in many of your papers, so some of you will be familiar with. So for me, what, what energy, the, the, the contours of energy humanities as I see it uh, roughly offers us three uh, key points. Uh, the first has to do with periodization. So yesterday, Stan was talking about peer, you know, periodize, so uh, um, quoting Jameson, of course. Um, so, the, so the first uh, gift, I suppose, of, of energy humanities is, uh, is, is what uh, Imre Zeman and Dominic Boyer uh, put in their foundational anthology, to be modern is to depend on capacities and abilities of generated, uh, uh, abilities generated by energy. We are citizens and subjects of fossil fuels through and through, etc. And they go on to say, what if we are to think of history of capital, not exclusively in geopolitical terms, but in in terms of the forms of energy available to it at any given moment. This is, this is of course, a deliberate uh, echo of something that, uh, for instance, Eddie Kent has mentioned earlier on Patricia Yeager's now by about 10 years old call for reordering uh, literary uh, periodization uh, instead of divvying up literary works into 100-year intervals or categories harnessing the history of ideas. What happens if we sort text according to energy sources? Uh, that has made them possible. So uh, in, in energy humanities, the, the invitation to rethink historical periods and literary periods have emerged hand in hand together. A uh, second thing uh, uh, is really the centering of the idea of work and labor as, as, as a form of energy exchange. Uh, that has, again, um, I'm thinking of the work not, not, not only of Jason Moore, who has come up in various papers, but of someone like Andreas Mom um, uh, here. So that, that would be a second uh, gift of energy humanities, the, the, the idea of work or, uh, that is central to uh, our understanding of the long duration of modernity. Uh, and the third is, is the idea that energy, uh, the relationship between energy and power is, is 
almost a, a kind of always already given uh, um, aspect of thinking about energy. Mom says uh, the semantic confluence in the Anglophone world, uh, th thermodynam in, in the semantic co confluence of the Anglophone world, thermodynamic and social power are nearly always treated as distinct phenomenon, whereas in reality, he writes, no piece of coal or drop of oil has yet turned itself into fuel, and no humans have yet engaged in systematic large-scale extraction of, of either to satisfy subsistence needs um, um, or any other needs. It hasn't been done without, without human intervention is, is, is basically what he's arguing. So the conception of social power turns conventional, this conception of social power turns conventional accounts of history of industrialization on its head. The familiar story of industrial revolutions tend to privilege technological determinism where scientific entrepreneurs like James Watt appear to respond to solve, uh, to solve the structural crises brought about the scarcity of resources with their invention and thereby chart out a new pathology, uh, pathway to growth. But as Mom's uh, uh, meticulous study of the transition from water to steam power in Britain shows, this flies in the face of all available evidence. British industry, and particular British cotton industry, and again, I'm struck by how many times cotton has come up as a, almost a paradigm example of, of, of transition debates, did not suffer from the scarcity of water or rise in cost of setting up water mills. Rather, the switch from water to steam, or from, in his words, flow to stock in Mom's vocabula uh, vocabulary, happened because it better served the interests of the capitalists as a class over that of British workers, and that's what he argues in his, uh, in his book. So the key components of flow energy, like running water, light, and wind, are rest communes because they're difficult to appropriate for individual use. Stock energy, such as coal and oil, on the other hand, are piecemeal, splintered, amenable to concentration, and accumulation, and divisible, and therefore congenial to the logic of private property. It is this material logic contained in stock energy form rather than any techno-scientific invention that made, its fusion, uh, that made its fusion with the social logic of British industrial capitalism both possible and desirable, according to him. So the third insight of energy humanities is social power is always composed of different kinds of energy resources and that energy resources are always already socialized. Now, periodization, labor, power or periodization work power. So it is not hard to see how each of these concepts re-energized as it were can be valuable for a post-colonial studies prime to ask the right questions and to look for some appropriate answers in an epoch defined by the interlinked crises of climate, capital, and world hegemony. But so far, any consideration of justice has been rather muted among the energy humanists. To a large extent, this may be because of the work of conceptually distinguishing energy justice from the longer established environmental justice is ongoing. It is also the case that arguments about energy justice have tended to, for institutional and disciplinary reasons, have circulated outside the usual reaches of humanities scholarship in journals such as energy policy, environmental justice, and eco ecological economics. So this is actually a a very appropriate forum, it, the interdisciplinarity of this, uh, of our gathering is, that, is in, in, for me, designed uh, in a way to kind of address this, address this lacuna. But surely that is all the more reason to instig integrate justice as one of the core issues of any scholarly inquiry that marches behind the banner of energy humanities. Serving the impact of an already decades-old environmental justice movement in 1999, David Schlossberg pointed out that then um, the environmental justice uh, movement begins with two central issues, uh, inequity of the distribution of environmental risk and recognition of the diversity of the participants and the experiences of environmental justice movement. This integration of the distributional equity and recognition comes in the form of the demands for more public participation in the development, implementation, and oversight of environmental policy. The movement argues that procedural equity in, in a, is a way uh, to address both the distribution and recognition uh, problems. Now, Schlossberg was critical of the organization of the environmental justice movement, especially in the US, which he saw as racially and economically homogeneous and privileged, uh, and privileged the possession of resources or wealth as the basis of their activism. 
this is not entirely fair, um, as Adamson, Evans, and Stein's uh, landmark collection from 2002 shows, much of the environmental justice movement was in fact activated against the global corporatism, the mass move protests against WTO meetings at Seattle, Toronto, G Genoa, etc., alive to the racial dimensions of the environmental in 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 inequities. Um, so, for example, uh, the 1987 report on racial justice by the United, uh, United Church of Christ Commission in the U.S., and able to deploy acute analysis of capitalism and colonialism and environmental degradation. Neera Jain may be closer to the mark when she suggests that struggles for environmental justice do not only involve integrating distributional, procedural, and recognition justices, but are also about, quote, ways of knowing, being, and valuing, that is, epistemological, ontological, and cognitive justices. Without these latter, for example, it is difficult to see how we can demand sacrifices such as degrowth economic policies from those nations and societies disproportionately located in the global north that have hitherto benefited from the forcible crafting of sacrifice zones in much of the rest of the world. So energy justice thus grows on ground turned over by the environmental justice movement, but also seeks to open fresh channels in it. One key difference between these two is that energy justice tries to frame itself in relation to both the producers and consumers of commodities in the modern world system. An energy just world would, would be one that promotes happiness, welfare, freedom, equity, and due process for both producers and consumers. There it is different from the general environmental justice movement. It would distribute environmental and social hazards associated with energy production and use without discrimination. This is a quotation from Sovacol and Dworkin. On the one hand, such attempts to see the dynamics of the modern world relationally involving producers and consumers try to address the pitfalls of addressing the issue of injustice from one corner of the social field dominated by consumption. On the other hand, the attempt to treat all actants equally, uh, it ignores, perhaps, that already existing unevenness of power relations between them, one that, for instance, is recognized by the demands of degrowth sacrifices as reparations. The enmeshing of the principles of procedure, distribution, and recognition also allows energy justice scholars to shift the problem of efficiency from economic to ethical terms, such as virtue. Thus, everything from human rights abuses to fully environmental impact assessment to full, uh, uh, faulty environmental impact assessment and energy poverty are rejected on deontological grounds rather than because of their possible consequences. Another difference between energy and environmental justice is that the latter's attempt to break free of what may be called the proximity bias of the former. The classic environmental justice movement builds upward and outward from the local and regional levels to those of the national and international, the global and the worldly. It is at its strongest in the organizational, conceptual, theoretical, and activist terms at its core where specific events of environmental degradations are located. In contrast, by taking vulnerability and capacity as guiding frames, energy justice tries to move in the reverse direction, from the global and to or worldly to the local and regional levels in a systemic and relational manner. One additional distinction between the two lies in the way, uh, lies in, the way in which breaks and transitions are accorded primacy by energy justice scholars, um, thinking about the problems of temporality and periodization of energy regimes. This focus on the breaks result in the conceptual primacy of discontinuity and incommensurability, rather than that of assumed continuity and homogeneity of and between eras. Energy justice scholars argue that this attention to the, disjunction, to the disjunctive relationality between the historical times have resulted in the incorporation of the principle of restorative justice, where the primary, where the primary aim is to it is to, in the future, repair the harm done to the individual or communities in past rather than punishing the perpetrators as well as identifying where and where prevention needs to uh, happen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now switch to the texts recognizing that justice in fact, or the issue of the issue of justice, in fact, has been a cornerstone in the historiography of coloni colonialism in South Asia and in many other parts of the world. But I'm interested in thinking that that idea of justice doesn't really fold into itself the concept of energy as such. In missing that, it misses a lot of what the literature is doing in the 19th century, and I want to turn to the literature here. Um, 
Okay, so in one sense, we can clearly gather, and let's see if I have a... text okay so in one sense we can clearly gather both texts under the so that is Neil Dorpon and uh, and and Rudyard, and Rudyard Kipling's bridge builders under the rubric of what Tabish Khair has in another context called Babu fiction that is they dramatize the affinities and co competitions across racial lines between men who are simultaneously privileged and dominated and who put forth their claims to what Titi Bhattacharya has called sentinels of culture what is interesting for, I'll go through that, uh, those are the sentinels of culture, uh, the, the men uh, who are instrumental in getting Neil Dorpon published. Um, what is interesting f uh, that for Mitra and Kipling both, such claims for hegemony are made through the twinned language of justice and energy. And this is where a lot of the uh, scholarship on uh, the injustices of colonial, um, colonialism in the 19th century might have missed. Uh, Ranajit Guha shrewdly notes about Neil Dorpon that at the time of its publication, Mitra was uh, one of those young men who managed to have some bad prose and worse verse in Shambhad uh, Prabhakar between 1853 and 1856, so it's not a ringing endorsement of, of, of Dinamundu Mitra. That the play itself received indifferent critical reception, that the topic was hardly a revelation, and yet a luminary like Shibnath Shastri over there um, uh, could pronounce that Mitra's play had spoken for their generation. Guha's explanation is that only when the indigo planters decided to sue it for libel, the play for libel, that the literati of Calcutta, both Indian and European, decided to rally behind the play and in the process turn the text into a, what he calls a pretext for the fabrication of a nice little middle class myth about a liberal government, a kind hearted Christian priest, a great but impoverished poet, and a rich intellectual who is also a pillar of society. A veritable league of power and piety and poetry standing up in the defense of the poor riot or the cultivator. Coming when it did, this myth did more than all, more than all else to comfort a bhadra look or gentlemanly conscience unable to reconcile a borrowed ideal of liberty, it's a, it's a good phrase, with a sense of its own helplessness and cowardice in the face of a peasant revolt. That is, it is the legal context of the performance and the countervailing visions of justice offered by the play that its post-colonial reputation rests on. Neil Dorpon's Bhadralok credentials are paraded immediately in a series of prefatory remarks before the action begins. The real risk of pauperizing the Bengal riot, a peasant proprietor, to the condition of a serf, we hear, is that it dooms the imperial efforts. This is a preface written by Michael Modushudan Dotto, who's, who's the poet that, um, that um, uh, um, uh, Ranajit Guha was talking about earlier. Um, is imagined as the mother of the people who has now taken them on her own lap to nourish them and dispatch many great men who will very soon take hold of the rod of justice in order to stop the sufferings which the riots of the peasants are enduring from the great giant Rahu, the indigo, indigo planter. But such anti-radical reassurances are secured in the play through a staging of conflict between the metabolic imperatives of animate power and that of waterborne flow in mom's uh, vocabulary. Um, the indigo plant is the source of blue dye, still used extensively in cotton textiles, and as Guha, Sarkar, and many other, Shumit, this is Shumit Sarkar I'm talking about, and many others have argued, the indigo rebellion of 1860s was in response, if you look at the map, let's see if, if I can go back to the map, sorry. Ooh. Hang on. What's the way to go back to the map? Does anyone know? I can keep talking while the solution arrives. Um, okay, so in, um, where was I? Okay, so um, the Indigo Rebellion of 1860 was in response to a constellation of national and international crises. A slump in London indigo prices, the Union Bank crash in Calcutta, uh, the consequent squeeze put on more modest planters by the sector's big beasts, which mean that the cultivators were increasingly terrorized into growing a crop that was economically unviable for them. This is, of course, a general colonial pattern. Thanks very much, Devin. Um, 
Now let's see if, oh. Okay. I'll keep talking. Um, Okay, so this is generally a colonial pattern globally, of course. If planted as a cash crop alongside a food crop like rice, it can then lead to a competition for the energy flows to the detriment of the latter. In Mitra's play, the global crisis of falling profit, profit rates in colonial agribusiness can only be shown through a specific local conjuncture where soil, water, air, and other forms of flow energy are directed away from the subsistence needs of the cultivators to the planter's profit imperative. Hunger, therefore, appears as the most recognizable sign of this energy rupture. Golok Chandra Basu, uh, one of the key gentleman farmers uh, of, of, uh, in, in the play, laments in the opening moments of the play, Shwarapur is not a place where people are in want. It has rice, peas, oil, molasses, vegetables in the field, and fish in the tanks. Whose heart is not torn when obliged to leave this place? We are given to understand that the scarcity which compels the big and small riots to migrate is engineered by loans forced on them by the European planters in order to divert their land and labor to indigo cultivation. Hunger also affects people disproportionately in the play. It is much more acute for the tenant farmers like Shaduchoron or Torapa than the landowners like Golok Basu and his family. The latter's claim to gentlemanliness in the play is secured not only, as Guha rightly argues, through the possession by the men, specifically, of a certain amount of cultural capital, the ability to access colonial law courts, for example, their familiarity with Shakespeare, whose works in translation is cited by Bindu Madha, one of Golok's son, in, the latter, uh, uh, in, the, in his letter to his wife, but also via their voluntary subjection to the afflictions of starvation, that is, energy deprivation, in solidarity with their te tenant farmers. Bindu Madhav underscored this, uh, underscores this in the third act of the play when he explains that the Basu family has other ways of living. The loss of indigo for one year or two might stop feasts and religious ceremonies, but they will not produce want of food. But since this is not an option for the smaller riots or smaller present, uh, peasants, they seek a confrontation with the planters wood and rose. When Golok loses his case and is jailed, he fasts for four days before committing suicide. His death brings the riots on the, brings of, uh, on, on the brink of insurgency, but the moral fiber of gentlemanliness requires their refusal to turn their self-sacrifice self into a trigger for radical action. 200 riots with clubs in their hands are crying aloud, I told them to go to their houses. Since if the sahibs get the least excuse, he will burn the whole village. Thus, Mitra, thus Mitra's gentlemen farmers accrue what Guha calls borrowed ideals of liberty uh, through a stage conflict between flow and animate energy forms. But we can go a little further than this. What is often overlooked in the discussion of Mitra's play is how sexuality and religion are integrated within this matrix of interplay between energy forms, not only to indigenize liberalism, but also to recast it in a conservative Hindu mold. This will be this is interesting to compare to those who are following events in India today, and for reasons we might come back to in the Q&A. The play's outrage lies not only in the planter's unjust appropriation of Basu's lands, but also in their encroaching upon the sexual claims of the indigenous patriarchs on their women, and thereby redirecting the social and sexual reproduction away from their designated task. Such appropriations are not only seen as unjust, they're also coded in terms of dishonor. What honor remains to us now? The planter has prepared his places of cultivation around the tank. The tank is the pond around which the women do their daily washing and bathing and so on. In that case, our women will be entirely excluded from the tank. The dishonoring of indigenous patriarchy culminates in the rape of women like Ketramuni, who dutifully interprets her violation as an assault not against herself, but against her husband. The suffering of Ketramuni after her rape is likened to that of stillbirth or abortion, and her final anguished plea to be turned on her bed to my father's side uh, confirms uh, the general direction of, of that presentation. The play itself ends with the figure of Shabitri, Gokul's widow, cradling the dead body of her eldest son, Nobin, while attempting in vain to force her breasts in, uh, into his mouth. Bindu, her surviving son, arrives to find another dead body, that of Nobin's widow, widow Shorolotha, who has earlier been killed by Shabitri. 
The injustice of indigo plantation system then is, sh then is shown in, 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 its, in its forcible appropriation of the socially and materially reproductive energies of land, water, and women together. Honor in the play is not, not, uh, is not only gendered, but also communal. Not only because it, draws, uh, draw, uh, it is drawn in contrast to European women, such as the planters' wives, whose shamelessness is exhibited in the public appearance on horseback, but also because it is Muslim men, like Amin, who, as the planters' agents, are directly responsible for its violation. Drawing on the hoariest and crudest is Islamophobic stereotypes, Mitra draws Amin as a corrupter of the proper channels of animate energy. He has served up his own sister to his master's pleasures in order to further his career, and his very body is seen as anathema to Hindu sensibilities. Oh, the beard when he speaks. It is like a he-goat twisting about its mouth. Fie, fie, the bad smell of onions. You'll, you'll, those of you following events in India will notice how often food and cuisine comes up as codes for uh, the otherness that must be stamped out um, uh, by, by the... Uh, in, 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 the, in, in the Hindu state about to be born. He's the degenerate who is instrumental in Khetramoni's rape, the force who's ruining the country to the extent that his religious marker, Musulman or Muslim, is used as a term of abuse amongst the Hindu riots. Amin's graphic violence against the peasants is of a piece with his sexual violence against their women. He's the other against which the moral credentials of a Hindu liberal order and of the reordering of energy as secured by Mitra. Now, written nearly four decades after Mitra's play, Kipling's Bridge Builders is often and correctly read as a paradigm of muscular imperialism uh, that, that presents work, uh, in particular men's work, as the raise of the, th the author of, of Empire. By comparing it to Mitra's play, and in keeping in mind some of the interpretative protocols of energy humanities, we may be able to offer a slightly different conclusion. That for Kipling, true justice is only realized through uh, material work, that work is racialized and gendered in so far that only some uh, white European men seem to be able to properly function, uh, to properly perform it, while it behoves upon others, non-white, non-European men, to follow the examples of the former, and that this idealized brotherhood is achieved by a balancing of the forces of flow and stock energies, uh, which, which is brought about by judicious use of animate power. The story begins with the engineer Finlayson's sovereign surveying of the imminent completion of his um, good work, the great Kashi Bridge being thrown across the river Ganges. Such work demands simultaneously the mastery of the aquatic forces of the river, the entropic drag of state bureaucracy and tropical disease, and the animate power of the colonized humans and beasts under his charge. Generally, the latter cannot really be distinguished against each other, the one crawling and climbing out of the yawning borrow pit below, the other by, a hundred, by the hundred swarmed about the lattice sidewalk. There's no, really, there's no really cue as to say which one is human, which one is animal. But there is an exception. The foreman of the Indian laborers, Peru, who is a Lusker, familiar with every port from Rockhampton to London, and who, after rising to the rank of a serang on the British India boats, has wearied of his work discipline there and is thrown up uh, the service and gone inland. Peru's familiarity with the flow of the sea, his expertise with tackle and handling of heavy weights, the authority he wields over the laborers in the name of honor, make him not only an invaluable assistant to the British engineers Finlayson and Hitchcock, but virtually the co-author of the civilizing mission. Kipling serves this liberal assumption, qualified and precarious, um, of equality, of racial equality, with an expert dose of irony. When Finlayson smiles paternalistically at Peru's proprietorial behavior towards the bridge, the readers are invited to smile back at the Englishman's easy assumption of superiority through accounts of Peru's heroism that saved the girder of the number seven pier from destruction when the new wire jammed in the eye of the crane and the huge plate, plates tilted on its sling, in its slings. Peru's instinct of water compels him to warn Finlayson that the, re that the river is bound to react unfavorably to being bitted and bridled by the bridge since she is, quote, she is not like the sea that can beat against the soft beach. 
The engineer is skeptical since Peru offers this insight in the distinctly non-secular language of Hindu cosmology. The bridge from, Findl from Finlayson's point of view is meant to undergird the secular triumph of fossil or stock energy steam railways over that of the flow of the Ganges. For him, the railway bridge also stands for a militarized imperial order, loopholed for musketry and pierced for big guns, and signifies the pakka or the permanent way of empire. But it is Peru's instinct that proves to be superior. The, the bridge challenges Mother Ganga, but when she talks, I know whose voice will be the loudest. When unseasonal rainfall upstream results in flood that threatens the bridge and along with it, the honor of imperial work. As was the case in Mithra's play, honor here is a key component both of patriarchy and of justice. Peru urges his workmen to quote, fight the river hard for it is thus that a woman wears herself out. And even as the floods threatens the destruction of countless Indian lives and property, the villages on the banks and so on, it is his own honor that Finlayson is most worried about. Mother Ganga would carry his honor to the sea with the other raffle. Governments might listen, perhaps, but his own kind, that is the engineers, would judge him by his bridge as it stood or fell. At this critical juncture in the tussle between the flow of the river and the stock of the railway bridge, a particular kind of indigenized animate power intervenes. As the exhausted workers watch the floodwaters creep up the bridge, Peru offers some opium pellets to Finlayson, which he claims are, quote, meat and good toddy together, and they kill all weariness besides the fever that flows the rain. I have eaten nothing else at all. Clean malwa opium. Much like indigo, opium was the key imperial cash crop, and so far the profits accrued from his export from India, most famously to China, of course, were, essentially, were essential for maintaining a favorable balance of trade and geopolitical power. And its cultivation diverted massive amounts of land, water, and labor that would other, otherwise have been expended on subsistence agriculture. In making it the drug of choice for Indian laborers who use it to fend off the effects of their depleting metabolic reser reserves caused by the lack of food, as well as that of the English engineer who dulls with it the anxiety caused by the impending loss of honor, Kipling reveals uncan an uncannily accurate picture of both the political and the energy unconscious of modern imperialism. For with a strike, striking flick of a narrative switch, the ingestion of opium takes us from a realist to what Michael Lowy has usefully called the critical irrealist register. Instead of firing up his capacity to keep up his vigilant, vigilance on the bridge, the opium activates a dream work in Finlayson which holds the key to solving the standoff between empire's flow and stock energies. Finlayson's opium dream is of Hindu gods, the earlier scene we saw, debating the fate of the bridge and by extension that of British Empire in India. When Ganges in the shape of a crocodile complains about the bridge builders taming her, she's answered by Ganesh, the elephant god, and Shiva, the bull, that, is, uh, that it is the coal-powered railways that had ushered in the era of the fat money lenders, since all the towns are drawn together by the fire carriage, and money comes and goes swiftly, and the account books grow as fat as myself. On the one hand, this dream work justifies empire through the hegemony of a class fraction. It is assumed that what is good for the fat money lenders is good for everyone. On the other hand, it reverses or at least modifies Finlayson's hitherto militarized vision of imperial work. No musketry loops or gun ports here disturb the steady accumulation of wealth. It falls to Krishna, one of the original Hindu trinity, to pronounce judgment on the epochal nature of stock energy that drives the railways. Great kings, the beginning of the end is born already. The fire carriages shout the names of the new gods that are not old under new names. Drink now and eat greatly. Bathe your faces in the smoke of the altars before they grow cold. As men count, the time is the end is far off, but as who knows reckon it is today. The peace between the flow of Ganges and the stock of the railway bridge is brought about by the opium-fueled metabolic surge in the an animate power of the imperial workers. Thus, this balancing act between the material forces of empires is replicated in its ideological domain. 
If Finlayson enters the non-secular world of Peru through the opium smoke, Peru travels in the reverse direction as Finlayson emerges from his reverie. He relates to the Englishman what his near-death experience during a sea storm on board of an English ship has taught him. If I lose hold, I die. And for me, neither Rewa nor my place by the galley where the rice is cooked, nor Bombay, nor Calcutta, nor even London will be any more. How shall I be sure, I said, that the gods to whom I pray will abide at all? Peru's work on the English steamship in this respect confirms the judgment of Krishna that Finlayson witnesses. It is just both deontologically and consequentially. So post-colonial scholarship usually reads Kipling and Mitra in oppositional terms, one as an arch-imperialist, Kipling, the other as a radical nationalist, Mitra. But by paying attention to how they registered the various forms of energy that charged the everyday life of empire, we can detect the currents of mutual interest that bound them almost despite themselves. Their investment in a specific, even peculiar kind of justice, class-bound, gender and race, and caste-inflected, and marked by a temporary and precarious masculine fellowship, if not equality, makes visible the contradictions that run through every level of modern capitalist imperialism and colonialism. It also alerts us to the fact that liberalism and authoritarianism can have at, at their cores similar understandings of justice to activate their own respective claims to world order. Such approaches may help us to think about postcolonial studies in a new key for an era that is hotly tipped to be the final signal, to finally signal the end of the capitalist scene. So I'll stop there and maybe in the Q&A go through some of the, um, some of the uh, images. Thank you. Sorry, that was the map I was trying to locate, which shows you the indigo districts in Bengal. Um, again, we can talk about this in the Q&A. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, so for those of you who are joining us online, um, I just remind you to follow the link and type in questions into the chat function. I'll be happy to try to feed them in to the Q&A. But we've got a, plenty of time to talk. It looks like a good half hour. Thank you, that was really wonderful and um, really rich. I just wanted to um, kind of register uh, some of the um, claims that you were making around uh, gender and sexuality that were so interesting and you know, thinking about the way that you were thematizing labor in relation to the energy humanities and then you know, the, um, uh, sorry, I don't know the play, Neil, Neil Darpin with yeah. the ending with the, the failed breastfeeding and it just, set me down, you know, thinking about women's unpaid labor and, you know, where that fits within the, the energy regimes um, uh, that you're describing. And, and then also uh, the gendering of the river that you were talking about. And so I guess I'm just wondering if, um, you know, if you could say a little mm. bit more about yeah. how gender fits into that. I, f I feel in general that sometimes the energy humanities is not altogether attentive to, you know, questions of um, feminism and gender. Yeah. So um, I just really yeah. appreciated that and wondered if you wanted to yeah. say a Thanks, little more Liz. about it. Yeah, thank you. This, this is why, as, 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 uh, for me, I think, and, and obviously it's an evolving field, part of the Q's energy humanities and in energy justice uh, movement might want to take from, is from the literature itself, which, are, which in fact are attentive, uh, is attentive to the issues that you've just uh, pointed out. So even in a text like Mitra, which is uh, ultimately uh, interested in presenting the credentials of the heroic uh, Bhadralok, uh, the play is very alive to uh, the work of social reproduction, right? So, uh, and sexual reproduction. And a large part of the play is uh, about uh, both the struggles and the failures and, um, uh, I guess the violent uh, dominance of, of, of both 
English but also Indian uh, men uh, over their women. And, and he doesn't really shy away from portraying that. The, the, the scenes of the breastfeeding of the dead child is, is, is quite a graphic note on which it ends, the scene of rape, etc. And sure, the whole kind of paying homage to my father, etc. But it doesn't really shy away from those issues. Uh, now, that might be, of course, how texts work, and Mitra himself um, uh, is not particularly interested in making those claims. But the literature itself does, and this is true, of course, of Kipling's whole brotherhood thing that runs through all his work, really. Um, about, uh, the, the texts themselves are constantly gesturing towards the kinds of labors that are erased and registered, um, particular gendered labor that are erased and registered in this exchange or the equilibrium of energies that it is finally proposing as a solution to the imperial dilemma. So, uh, I would suggest that one of the things that uh, any theory, but also uh, any theoretical or academic practice, certainly, uh, and activism, uh, sh might profit from is actually looking at what the literature is doing uh, back then already. Uh, and that is really a part of you know, my argument, so yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just interested in two things: the question of periodization mm. and how that links in with uh, links up to energy, uh, the en energy humanities and environmental studies. Now, the, the play that you uh, brought brought forward today, it uh, generated the Dramatic Performances Act of 1876, yep. Yep. Uh, which introduces censorship into theatrical performances, and which is still on the law books yeah. in independent India. Yeah. Uh, as late as 1993, it was suggested that this act be scrapped. It wasn't. Uh, in the 1950s, there was a Malayalam play, You Made Me a Communist, uh, which actually revolved around agricultural you know, uh, labor and their struggles mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. feudalism. So I'm just wondering for one thing, you know, how convenient this kind of periodization might be if we use a different paradigm. Yeah. And that would spill over to, to my other question re regarding the bridge builders. That story also has the gods as a panchayat, not, as a, not in a court, but as you know, villagers sure. yeah. or animals yeah. conferring. And one of the arguments they advance is that the uh, use of uh, the railways actually brings pilgrims yes. <laughs> yes. to their religious shrines. So again, I'm wondering really, I mean, can we, uh, are we shouldn't we complicate this? <laughs> Yeah. a little more if we are going to think in terms of you know, how we use this paradigm and will that in some ways promote perhaps you know, a greater, I think, discussion of yeah, I mean, how we understand. Yeah, I mean, thank you for those references. Ab ab absolutely, I mean, that's part, part of, um, I, I suppose I abridge those references to uh, periodization. But if, uh, if, if indeed energy humanities and thinking about energy and the relationship between literary periodization is, has to be done seriously, your examples are great in, the, in, in so far that, uh, so what are we talking about when we think about, I mean, th that colonial law is not the only colonial law that remains on the books of in India today, right? So uh, section 144, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are all colonial laws that have remained on the books of the state specifically, of course, to diffuse the challenges mounted culturally against it, and not just culturally against it, etc. So already there, we're talking about one kind of periodization where, in terms of colonial lawmaking, that by no means has ended, right? It's a long duration of the colonial lawmaking. As opposed to that is the history of, or adjacent to that, is the history of a literary periodization by which we might think of Neil Dorpo not only as a particularly um, sort of eruptive moment of modern theater in, 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 in Indian history, but also what kinds of uh, stylistic gestures it brings to the, uh, to the table, etc., which doesn't really sit um, uncomplicatedly in the history of uh, theater in India, but also literary, hist literary historical thinking about what is modernism at all. So those two kinds of uh, cross-hatched uh, periodization, one of colonial legal periods and one of Indian literary history or any other literary, and one of the things 
um, I hope uh, we can, uh, I can, I, I wanted to extrapolate from there is whether to what extent this is generalizable across the world, not just, I, I spoke of South Asia as example, but clearly this might be uh, thought of in, in a global context as well. So those would be cross-hatched examples of literary periodization and periodization of law that then complicates our understanding of both legal evolution, but also how we understand modernism globally. Uh, through so that would be so. Thank you for those references, and they're uh, they're absolutely uh, on point. Um, so, so the second question, your your second question, had to do with how um, that issue of periodization might be further complicated by the bridge builders. The, the, the bridge builders. Now, Kipling is always, I find, you know, it's a, um, it's a he's an amazingly um, productive writer to think with, and and of course literary period-wise, he's on that cusp between the kind of, how do we think of him as a Victorian writer, we think of him as a modern writer. So again, those are, when you pay attention to what is actually going on in the text, it helps us elongate. So how do we think of Kipling as, you know, which period does he belong to? Those questions become much more complicated, refracted uh, by overall conception of, uh, I suppose, uh, modernism in, in, in a kind of existing in a complicated relationship with modernity and modernization. So part of, I mean, for me, it's, it is a compelling argument to be made about, about Kipling as a modernist writer in, in, in very obvious ways. When you think about that, those sequence of the sequential thinking about first, first uh, you know, Victorians, then modernists, et cetera, those all get scrambled out uh, uh, in, in, in a productive way. So, uh, I completely agree with, and that's, that's what partly energy humanities should be allowing us to do. Um, um, so thank you for those references as well. Uh, thank you, Pablo, so much for that. There's so much to think about there. Uh, I was particularly struck with the, the kind of comment you made about the ways that flow energy in soil, water, and air, uh, the commons uh, of energy there, is turned to stock energy by big agribusiness, and that that's a change of energy and accompanying social logic becoming visible as famine. So I wondered if you have reflected or would like to reflect on, on how this relates to energy, energy justice to non-human lives, uh, and even lives that are themselves kind of assemblages. You know, it strikes me that, say, a river once dammed turns from commons flow to private stock in that way, and that, that energy is redirected in this way. Countless non-human lives that had access to that commons energy are affected, mm. And, mm. and even the life of the river, if yeah. you can call it that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to return to the point you opened with, really, you know, how how might this contemporary debate now about giving rights and 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 to rivers and lakes, for example, yeah. to seek justice for them, yeah. be, you know, introduced and revised in the colonial writing, post-colonial yeah. writing you're reading? Yeah, Thanks. no, thank you. That's I haven't thought about it uh, at length, but clearly the Kipling text is 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 very productive that way as well. So because it is the river demanding justice, etc. So uh, part of what Kipling does, th mostly through his um, not mostly, but uh, for example in his animal fables, jungle books, etc., uh, is is to, although they're heavily anthropologized, uh, anthropologized etc., is to at least raise this question about the relationship between the conceptual demands for such as justice and to think about the boundaries between the human and the non-human in, in productive ways, it becomes really interesting in the context of the debates within South Asia uh, about the boundaries of the human and the non-human, which often spans across caste lines, so you know, who, who can be human, etc. And uh, that is uh, quite often uh, refracted through questions about the proximity between uh, certain castes and non-human forms uh, of life, usually animal form, animalistic forms of life. So this whole problem of, and Kipling is interesting on caste uh, in, in, his, in his writing uh, as such. So that would be a, a very interesting way of extending uh, back our contemporary debates on, on rights, back to the moment of conceptualizing the colonial world relationally between the human and the non-human. 
Uh, not so much Dina Bondu Mitro so in, my, in my judgment, but there are many, many other examples that I need to uh, think with your help uh, through, uh, and not just in South Asia. So this would, this would open up that whole arena. And I, haven't, I don't really know whether energy justice has made those, um, made those yards yet. Uh, by and large, it is still uh, focused on uh, issues of human consumption and human production. Um, and that would be another way of extending that. So again, thank you. I haven't thought um, deeply or widely or at all about, about those uh, directions. But it, it is opened up. Um. So we have a question from uh, Sukanya Banerjee, joining us again from the cold north. Um, I'll just read it out, not as beautifully as she would. Uh, thanks for the suggestive talk. With reference to Neil Darkman, it could be said that Adivasis, indigenous peoples, occupy a conceptual no place in the play. How do they feature in your reading of the play? Hmm. And also, more broadly speaking, in your rendition of energy justice and its relation to a retooling of post-colonial studies, as it were, can you say more about the relation, how that relation gets framed with reference to indigenous peoples in India? Yeah, thanks, Shukana. <laughs> um, for not having an answer to that, but uh, um, in, in, in the play, so there's a series of uh, fragile, eroding boundaries between uh, the various castes and towards the frayed ends of it, it fades into the lower riot class, oftentimes who kind of historically, in other words, uh, and otherwise blends into the kind of Adivasi or indigenous uh, uh, um, uh, segments of the population. The play deliberately avoids, as far, uh, correct me if I'm wrong for those who know uh, the play better, uh, deliberately avoids engaging with Adivasis as a, as a, um, as a group. Uh, of course, this uh, immediately raises the question, which is what Ranajit Guha really is addressing in that essay, is the play, um, uh, because it is written in the background of a series of uh, indigo revolts where Adivasis play a major role, right? So in terms of the liberal credentials of the play, it is necessary that Adivasis should be written out, but there are gestures towards where this lower end of the caste rung, the, the boundaries are ambiguous or porous. So that in itself should, um, should signal to us what, what Mitra's project uh, is. As, of, as for the larger question of how the indigenous people fit in uh, to, uh, in India and elsewhere, of course, we've been speaking of the last couple of days about, for example, in the contemporary Canadian context uh, of building pipelines. So, uh, of course, all the, all the extractive activities are do mostly done over indigenous lands, right? So that's how we uh, approach it uh, now. Um, but these and one of the things that strike me, what, what, what Shukana suggests here, a, a way of thinking back from where we are to the 19th century is how, how are the Adivasis or indigenous people um, classified? What were the tools of the classification at that time? Largely, in the case of South Asia, census, and in, in other cases also, where, the, where the, the bureaucratic exercise of population counting uh, then makes certain people, uh, uh, well, certain groups of people occupy certain social spaces against which certain actions can be taken. So part of, part of uh, these plays are also, uh, or, or the, these works of literature, are also raising the questions of uh, not only imagining indigeneity, but also retracing the history of the formation bureaucratically and otherwise in the imagination of the state. And, whether, and to what extent the literature um, is interrogating that, is, is, is uh, compliant with that, etc., might be one way of thinking about what we think of indigeneity today as, as, as a product of really an energy tussle that's going on in the 19th century about uh, extraction. But thank you, Shukanna, for that, um, for that insight. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting, and it was giving me like a lot to think about. 
Um, I was wondering actually a question about sort of literary form and maybe how this is related to your discussion of, again, like fluid and stock energy um, and also just a performance sort of generally mm. and maybe then performing um, sort of uh, ideas of like indigeneity then. Mm. Um, since you are talking on um, theater, I wonder if like the performance that occurs in theater uh, has anything, I guess, to do with these forms of energy, even just in that structure itself? Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very good question. I mean, I'm, I'm more um, familiar with Kipling's formal ex experiments. That is, you know, there for everyone to see. In the, and, you know, there'll, there'll be other people in this audience who are better equipped to answer that. But my uh, understanding of the evolution of, in this case, Bengali theater, for example, uh, and the history of censorship that follows it, oftentimes is related to, in fact, the formal uh, promiscuity of, of, of the performance. So uh, typically, and this is, if any of you are familiar with ho Bollywood and Hindi cinema, will know this, will have experienced this viscerally, the whole, the, the, the punching of uh, melodrama, for example, with uh, song and dance. Um, so all those, uh, I suppose, local oral forms, so uh, singing and storytelling, for example, in, in, uh, in, uh, and how that's folded into theatricality and drama performance of 19th century, attracts a wide range of hostile commentary, quite often from Indian presses, right? The Indian, Indian, Indian gentlemanly press, who think this is an impure form, this, this is uh, too, not only too popular, but also morally corrupt because of, for example, you know, the presence of the women on stage who are, uh, who are embodying a certain vernacular idiom of self-representation, etc. Uh, so there's a large debate in, in, in um, Bengali and other kinds of Indian theater about what is how did how do we uh, uh, gauge this this uh, utterly promiscuous and anarchic form of performance on stage? Right. So a similar debate is going on about the formation of indigenous literature in in the literary uh, uh, literary critical journals uh, about what is the right way of writing a novel. What, for example, we were talking about Scott earlier, and one of the you know kind of classic debates in 19th century Bengal is, of course, how to, how do you write a Bengali Scottish Scot uh, Scottish uh, Bengali novel after Walter Scott? Uh, and uh, Bonkim Chatterjee has a particular answer to that, but everyone says, oh no, you know, look at what Bonkim's done. He's written a historical novel that ends with this kind of spectral figure who, who kind of appears and disappears in a, in a ray of light. So very similar debates about generic purity and generic boundaries that then you know, throw all kinds of people in all kinds of a tizzy. Like, so, so the interesting part of really, uh, the searching part of your question is, how do we read that generic promiscuity in the light of the exchange or um, the, 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 the production and reproduction of energy forms within which they are uh, produced, the, the performance produced? And that I'll have to think long and hard. So for example, in, in Neil Dorpon, the generic promiscuity of the performance, which is a mixture of melodrama and the historical, uh, is then used to register a series of, as we were saying just earlier, uh, uh, peasant uprisings, not just peasant uprisings, uh, Adivasi uprisings uh, around, the, around, the, around the Indigo period. Um, and that tells us interesting things about, or might tell us interesting things about, uh, the relationship between the formal promiscuity and how historiographically certain uh, events uh, remain, and this is of course the argument of the whole subaltern school, they remain unwritable in some senses, right? So that would be a very uh, interesting way of, of thinking about um, historical events, their relationship with, which are normally read as historical political events, but then reading them as environmental, energetic events, and then looking at the relationship between them and the formal. Uh, this is a long way of saying I'm not equipped to answer you, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another productive route uh, that we can go down if this is to take us anywhere. But thank you for your question. Thanks, that was great. I, I, I was um, interested in your comments on the um, early history of petro-colonial uh, conflicts, and I was wondering where you see Kipling fit within 
uh, that light. And there's you know all this um, great material from uh, Amitav Goshen and the people who talk about oil's uh, inscrutability mm. in our time. And uh, you know it's it's so interesting to me that uh, yeah. Kipling you know, becomes an automobilist um, around this time. Yes, yeah. and uh, yeah. and kind of writes on. Um, on oil's uh, domestic uh, attractions, yeah. uh, but never really seems like the, the uh, larger global uh, realities. And so I was curious about, you know, if you see Kipling uh, as uh, obscuring uh, this, the, the realities of this new uh, uh, global resource or, yeah. or, or not. So this is turning out to be a great Q&A because you're all telling me things I haven't thought of and which things <laughs> that, um, that all of us can think of together. So that essay by Ghosh, it always strikes me as how, I mean, Ghosh is, you know, I like his writing and he's a, he's a great intellectual. It always strikes me as how um, narrowly conceived his idea of narrative is when he, when he thinks in this essay that, you know, there's no oil, novel of oil encounter. So I keep thinking, well, really, so how do you thinking about novels in that case? You know, are you thinking of the kind of great realist novel, or are you thinking slightly wider than that? Because if you do, then there's, of course, then you see it everywhere. So, so your question about Kipling is really, um, again, a, br a brilliant one here, because it asks us to think about the oil encounters a registration in narrative differently, right? So it's not, you, you're not only, th because Ghosh in that essay talks about Munif and how that, you know, that's a you know, kind of fa failure in novelistic experiments, et cetera. Um, but if you widen the lens of what you understand by the, by, the, uh, by the intermeshing of narrative and the oil encounter, all sorts of things come up. So not, not just Kipling's fiction, but Kipling's nonfiction, right? In terms of his travel writing, for example. Um, and that would be, and that would be an invitation, really, to think about our uh, ideas of uh, narrative registrations of, in this case, oil encounter beyond, you know, a, a particular safe realm of a, of a this or that genre. So I would very much like to support your insight that we can and we should really think about Kipling, not only Kipling's fiction, and not only Kipling's, of course, fiction and non-fiction in a, in, a, in a relational and expanded way. I do see him as, as that transition figure between steam and oil, and a lot of his, for example, Gothic writing, his, um, uh, his ghost stories in particular, uh, register that, and we should really go and uh, call Amitav Ghosh and say, Here's, here, <laughs> here are narratives of oil encounters uh, that go far beyond the great, you know, the great realist novel experiment. Um, this might be a good time to put a plug in for uh, Mike's really excellent essay on Conrad and the oil encounter in the most recent issue of Victorian Literature and Culture. It's really good. <laughs> great, great plug. I'll look that up. Thanks so much, Pablo. I really enjoyed that talk. I had a question about the terrain on which justice is mm. sought, mm. right? These two texts highlight two different versions of pursuing energy justice. One is like, kind of ironically, um, the colonial subject through you know, fidelity to the efficacy of the colonial state and the reproduction of its Queen conservative Queen Victoria laws. will bring us Right, this, yeah, pre yeah, precisely, yeah, precisely. Yeah. Whereas Kipling, you know, as, as you correctly pointed out, you know, Finlayson doesn't give two cents about you know, what the government or the state will do his honor is me measured simply by this sub-community within the state. And so I'm wondering if you could have a, if you could talk about the ways in which literature like this, um, either anti-colonial, quasi-nationalist literature or explicitly pro-colonial literature, um, encourages its consumers, its audiences and its readers to think carefully about the apparatuses through which justice is delivered, right? It seems that one knows, is being taught how to obey the law, where the other knows that to really be a citizen, you know when to suspend the law and break the law. Hmm. Uh, uh, totally spot on, because Kipling, of course, is famously hostile to Whitehall and Britain, right? So, so you know, the kind of, um, his end, the Punjab school v. the uh, the the soft bureaucrats who have no idea about India. Mm -hmm. So he's ambivalent about st the state as a provider of justice, right? So he has a particular vision of what a state should be like, uh, especially if that state has imperial pretensions, which directly then threatens the kind of um, 
uh, petition that Dinabandhu Mitra is making, which is to the state, not to the local, not to the local magistrate, because that's all you know, Kipling-esque. And fun. But he, they have to look to Queen Victoria, which is, of course, what happens. Uh, the, in the majority um, or, the, or the dominant fraction of the Indian National Congress's then subsequent petition for or drive for independence then has to uh, suitor those two visions of what, which state can we ask justice from. Right, so so that points to a perfectly neat um, fracture in the idea of the rela the relationship between the subject, the legal subject, mm -hmm. but who's the legal subject subject to, and that is a vision of a state that is being contested in the nineteenth century, and those that contest is a part of the legacy that not just South Asians are living but today. Yeah, and it's ongoing right now. I'm, like I, I work in Alberta, I work on Treaty Six territory where these pipelines are, you know, being forced upon yeah. indigenous peoples. And those kind of claims are being, you know, if, if you want justice, you make an appeal to the Canadian state and you make an appeal to the language of treaty and, the, and these contracts that we entered into with you people so many hundreds of years ago. And, and that's a way to perform good subjectivity, right? But, you know, are there ways in which cultural productions that are not, you know, Hindu conservative yeah. or, or, or explicitly nationalistic, yeah. you know, or yeah. explicitly imperialistic. I mean, yeah. are there ways in which cultural productions can bring readers into a different form of political agency that has no correspondence with the colonial state or its apparatuses? That, that, that's what I'm trying to think about yeah. what this kind of work can do. And it, and it strikes me that, you know, one of the great ironies of history now is that Kipling is the one yeah. who provides that radical yeah. potential, like, you know, screw the state, yeah. do, do as you will, integrate Hindu mythology into your opium fever dream of modernity, this, this is the way that you can secure justice for well, yourself. Well, he and takes you part of the way, doesn't he? Because, right, you know, right, yeah. the, the other, I mean, in this context, the other uh, cultural form that comes in, uh, comes to my mind, is from the 1860s to 1880s, the Bengali song cycles about famines. And these are or oral forms uh, that, are, that are sometimes performed and sometimes not. The famine they're talking about has happened 100 years ago. Right, the Bengal Great Bengal Famine of 1780s. Right, so they suddenly there's a revival of these oral song cycles uh, that are frowned upon by the Dinavandhu Mitras of this world as being uncouth and not really literary in that sense. Uh, that has a and these songs have a very uh, intimate uh, relationship with what in Indian literature is called bortala writing. So you know the kind of ephemeral production of little magazines uh, by local presses in which these songs are often recycled, etc. That is immediately and there justice is not demanded from either Queen Victoria or. Uh, the kind of Punjab school, you know, uh, f figures, uh, because these are songs about famines uh, that killed a third of the Bengal, you know, Bengali population, uh, where neither the Punjab school nor Queen Victoria comes to your aid. So they have a completely different orientation of demanding justice, but they're of course not literary enough. So they circulate in these ephemeral magazines uh, that are published in popular presses, oftentimes by the hour or the day, very fragile books, chap books essentially. Uh, but that's that earlier point about what do we, what do we, what does energy justice or energy humanities asks us to do? Perhaps think of chap book productions. Dina Bondumitra's plays, Bon Kim Chandra's novels, and Kipling's in relation to each other, right? So it asks us to widen what we understand, not just by periods, but also what literature is. So that seems to me, you know, one of the things we take away from bringing through your question exactly what are the cultural forms that visualize justice differently? You have these kind of you know, mad songs about famines that happened, and this is, of course, Ireland is a very good kind of comparison here as well, the ballads and so on, and, and circulation of famine ballads uh, uh, side by side with the, with the emergent novel forms, etc. It asks us to think of literature differently and the relationship between components of literature differently, it seems to me. One of the sad things about inks is you always have to cut off the conversation right when it's heating up. Um, but I was wondering if we could give a round of applause to our speaker for a talk that was no, both mesmerizing. No, thank you for your questions.